Once upon a time, Boston, in Massachusetts, was marred by a period of decay and rampant crime. Yet, as time progressed, a remarkable transformation swept through the city, turning it into a thriving epicenter. Modern apartment complexes sprang up, luring wealthy professionals and giving rise to an era of prosperity. Boston's identity shifted, gaining the reputation of an urban utopia where expansive residential towers stood tall, many of which came with the protection of a security team. In 2017, however, a gruesome crime was uncovered in one of these penthouses, sending shockwaves throughout the city. Richard Field was born in Hammersmith, West London, and from a young age he always knew he wanted a career in the medical field. In 1999, he successfully completed his studies at Sheffield University's medical school before relocating to Boston, Massachusetts. In Boston, he embarked on a career as an anesthesiologist and pain specialist, working at prestigious institutions such as Brigham and Women's Hospital and Beverly Hospital. Additionally, he held a teaching role in pain management and anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. In 2010, Richard founded North Shore Pain Management a medical practice situated in Beverly. His approach to patient care was marked by exceptional dedication. Numerous patients credited him with transforming their lives and helping them effectively manage their pain. Among them, Jeffrey McDowell, who had endured back pain during his service as a Marine, described Richard as a level above other physicians. He stated, He's the reason I can walk today without being in excruciating pain. The depth of his gratitude was such that he jokingly remarked, You're lucky I don't kiss you, in a display of appreciation rarely seen with medical practitioners. Another patient expressed such profound admiration that they declared they would even follow Richard back to England if he ever chose to return. What set Richard apart was not only his remarkable ability to alleviate suffering, but also his genuine willingness to listen. This distinctive trait deeply resonated with his patients and solidified their trust in him. While establishing himself in Boston, Richard crossed paths with Linda Bolanos, a pediatric anesthesiologist at Massachusetts Eye and Ear. Despite the 11-year age difference, the two immediately formed a strong connection. Both were renowned for their goodness, kindness, and gentle nature, alongside their exceptional work ethic. Lena, who was originally from Colombia, had moved to the United States during her childhood. Her cousin Andrea Ustman, who she grew up with and saw as a sister, said of her, Linda wasn't a human being. She was an angel that God gave our family to make us happy. Lena had embarked on her medical journey as a young graduate, dedicating years to honing her skills in various hospitals as a pediatric anesthesiologist. At Massachusetts Eye and Ear, her performance was nothing short of exceptional, characterized by a blend of skills and compassion. Her unique ability to ease the fears of both children and their parents stood out prominently. Dr. Christopher Hartnick, a colleague of hers, expressed unwavering confidence in Lena's abilities, stating, If any of my three children were ever in need of anything with anesthesia, I would put them in her hands. Richard and Lena's kindness and compassion extended not only to their patients, but also to their families. Although they didn't have children of their own, their familial love and care knew no bounds. Nurturing the children within their extended family, they embraced these young lives as if they were their own. Amid the demands of personal lives and careers, Richard and Lena always found time to connect with their families, showing genuine interest in their pursuits. In 2013, Richard made a notable purchase, acquiring an opulent 11th floor penthouse condo in the McCallum Building on Dorchester Avenue for $1.945 million. This luxurious penthouse boasted proximity to the Boston Harbour, featuring amenities such as a full-time concierge and robust security services. The couple had plans and ambitions to marry in the near future. It was a quiet and cool evening in Boston on the 5th of May 2017. 
As the sun dipped below the horizon around 7.30pm, Matthias Heidenrich's phone lit up. During that moment he was at CVS, but upon returning home he noticed several text messages from his close friend, Dr. Richard Field. The initial message read, Call 111. The subsequent message stated, Gunman, followed by, In House. Five additional texts ensued, culminating with a solitary word, Serious. The content of the text messages perplexed Matthias, leaving him uncertain about their meaning. Upon rereading them, he deduced that the first message, Call 111, likely referred to calling 911. In retrospect, Matthias recollected, Eventually, I grasped the potential significance. I decided to respond to Richard's text, and then grew concerned. Upon receiving no response from Richard, Matthias's girlfriend contacted the concierge at the apartment complex, where Richard and Lena lived. The apartment complex concierge promptly dialed 911, reporting the distressing text message from Richard. Around the same time, Matthias called 911 as well, similarly reporting the text message. Slightly past 8.30pm, officers reached the apartment complex. Gathering in the lobby, they ascended via the elevator to the 11th floor. Adjacent to the couple's condominium, on a hallway floor, the officers encountered a set of keys and two parcels. Officer Scott McIsaac recounted the scene. I noted that the packages were disarrayed, which could potentially indicate evidence of a struggle. Approaching the entrance of the couple's residence, their firearms were poised, bracing themselves for the unknown. A series of knocks reverberated on the front door, accompanied by their self-identification, yet no response came from within. Met with silence, one of the officers employed the recently discovered set of keys to open up the front door. The condo's interior was in total darkness, prompting the officers to reiterate their presence. As they made their way inside, an individual emerged from the confines of the condo. Clad in dark attire, his hands concealed by gloves, he came into view. One of the officers commanded, Get down on the floor, get down on the ground. Recalling the moment, Officer McIsaac counted, It appeared to us that he was holding a firearm because of the way he was holding it. The shadowy figure seemed to elevate his arms, prompting Officer McIsaac to discharge his weapon. The man tumbled backwards, and the officer swiftly moved in to restrain him with handcuffs. Once secured, he delivered an unsettling message to the officers. There's dead bodies. You guys are going to die. They killed my wife. He made a cryptic mention of a sniper and cast a smile towards the officers. The man had sustained gunshot wounds to his hands, abdomen and leg, none of which proved to be life-threatening. Escorted into the hallway, he stood under guard as the officers regrouped to conduct a comprehensive sweep of the apartment. Given the uncertainty regarding potential occupants or further suspects within the premises, Boston's SWAT team was summoned for reinforcement, with Officer Christopher Carr at the helm. With their firearms drawn, they entered the apartment, commanding anybody present to exit with their hands raised. A haunting stillness permeated the apartment, and as the officers crossed the threshold, their attention was drawn to a black backpack brimming with Lena's jewellery. Nearby, another black bag revealed its contents. Two replica handguns, duct tape, a mask, pliers, scissors, a tactical knife, and more belongings of Linda. This discovery hinted at a thwarting of a burglary, but the sinister contents of the second bag merely hinted at the darkness that was to come. Blood smears marked the door foreboding the scene within the living room. When they entered, they came across Richard's lifeless body. I saw a male uh, lying on his face down with his handcuffs behind his back. He was lying in blood. He had um, significant wounds uh, around his neck. He was face down and surrounded in a pool of his own blood. 
His hands were handcuffed behind his back. Officer Carr knelt down beside him, searching for a pulse that wouldn't answer. Richard was dead. He had sustained a slashed throat. His corroded artery, which is the major neck artery carrying blood from the heart to the brain, was almost cut in half. This stab wound caused Richard to breathe blood into his lungs, and he would have bled out in just a few minutes. The officers pressed forward through the apartment, uncovering a chilling message etched onto the living room wall. He killed my wife. Above this grim proclamation were images chronicling the lives of Richard and Lena. One photograph of Richard bore a prominent X scribbled over his smiling face, and the word payback, scrawled nearby, only deepened the sense of foreboding. Continuing their exploration, the officers reached the couple's bedroom. There, they encountered Lena's lifeless body, hands bound behind her back, surrounded by a pool of blood. And I observed a female lying on her back with her hands behind her back inside of one of the bedrooms. She was not breathing and there were no signs of life. Her neck bore 24 sharp force injuries, including stabs and cuts, with one wound to her jugular vein proving most fatal. The evidence indicated a death brought about by multiple injuries, compounded by the grave wound to her jugular. Both Richard and Lena displayed wrist bruising, indicative of restraint. After ensuring the apartment's security, the officers arranged for Lena and Richard's transfer to the medical examiner's office. Meanwhile, detectives grappled with the individual found within the apartment, a man who was promptly identified as 30-year-old Bampum Texera. He was transported to the Tufts Medical Centre for treatment for his gunshot wounds as the double murder investigation quickly got underway. Bampum Texera hailed from Guinea-Bissau, a modest and economically challenged nation on Africa's western coast. Over in the United States, he had already gained attention from law enforcement before the tragic double murder. In September, he pleaded guilty to robbing a bank on Summer Street in Downtown Crossing twice. The first instance transpired on the 28th of August 2014, followed again nearly two years later on the 30th of June 2016. In both cases, Texera entered the bank, brandishing a note demanding money to the teller. A plea agreement with the defence and prosecution resulted in a one-year prison sentence. Remarkably, had his sentence been just a single day longer, deportation might have awaited him upon release. Following nine months of incarceration, Texera was freed on the 14th of April 2017, less than a month before the tragic deaths of Richard and Lena. Approximately two weeks after his arrest, he made a gesture towards reconciliation reaching out to apologise for his previous bank robberies to his former girlfriend. During the conversation, he said to her, I'm not a good person. The medical community was horrified by the murders of Richard and Lena, and President and CEO of Massachusetts Eye and Ear, John Fernandez, paid tribute to them, stating, Dr. Balanos was an outstanding paediatric anesthesiologist and a wonderful colleague in the prime of both her career and life. We will do all we can to support their families and our staff members who are processing this senseless tragedy and grieving an enormous loss. North Shore Pain Management also extended a tribute to Richard. They conveyed that his abrupt departure left an irreplaceable void within them while extending their sympathy to a circle of friends and family. Richard and Lena's family provided a statement and asked that people remember the couple for how they lived, not how they died. Richard's family asked for donations to Doctors Without Borders, a charity that was extremely important to the both of them. What added to the community's astonishment was the detective's assertion that Richard and Lena had known their killer in some capacity. Boston Police Commissioner William Evans commented, If someone would come here and go up to the 11th floor of a penthouse, we've got to believe there was some type of knowledge of each other. While detectives were assembling the details of the crime, they initiated an inquiry into how Texiera had gained access to the building. The apartment complex reportedly maintained a level of security, 
at least as per the account of the residents. Texera's path would have required surpassing the security and reaching the 11th floor, the location of the couple's residence. However, within the building existed a stairwell that connected the garage to the penthouse floor. Detectives soon uncovered that Texera would have known about this stairwell. In October of 2015, he was employed by Palladian Services LLC, the security company that served Richard and Lena's apartment complex and he had acted as concierge. He only worked there for around three weeks, but he knew the apartment complex like the back of his hand. He knew how to slip past the concierge by going through the parking garage and up the stairs to the penthouse. Even with his understanding, however, the motive underlying the double homicide remained elusive, prompting detectives to dig into the case even further. The scrawled note discovered within the couple's apartment held particular intrigue for the detectives. The note bore the words, He killed my wife. This led them to question whether Texiera had a wife and whether she might have been among Richard's patients. While looking into this potential angle, Texiera began to speak with detectives from hospital and he had an unbelievable story to tell. According to Texiera, he and Lena had been engaged in an affair for a considerable period, unbeknownst to Richard. In his interrogation with detectives, he expressed, I like her a lot. I love her. He recounted that on the fateful night of the murder, he had gone to the couple's condominium to visit Lena. He stated that Richard unexpectedly entered the condo, discovering their liaison and flying into a fit of rage. As per Texiera's account, Richard erupted with the words, I'm going to kill this bitch, and then proceeded to stab Lena twice. Texiera claimed that in response he sought refuge in the bathroom, but was later drawn to a confrontation with Richard. Asserting self-defense, Texiera said to the detectives, I wanted to do to him what he did to her. He claimed that it was either him or Richard, and that he had handcuffed Richard with his own handcuffs. He commented, It was hell, before adding, A jealous man is the worst thing ever. What I saw with my eyes was crazy. He said that after Lena and Richard were dead, he took Richard's backpack and filled it with jewellery from the bedroom so that he could make some money. This was trying to kill me. He has to pay for it too. I don't feel, I don't have no guilty conscience because I did nothing wrong. I was... However, Texiera's narrative diverged from the concrete details of the crime scene. Both Richard and Lena had been restrained, and Lena had suffered multiple stab wounds, not just two. Detectives probed further, skillfully avoiding the use of Richard or Lena's names during their questioning. They inquired about Lena's identity, prompting Texiera's perplexing response. Oh gosh. This is the first time I've seen her in months. A curious contradiction emerged. He professed love for Lena while failing to recall her first name. When questioned about the inconsistency, Texera defended his stance, stating, We don't talk about families. We talk about me and her. On the 8th of May, Texera faced a double murder charge. He participated in the arraignment from his hospital bed. Enveloped in a blanket, he remained in his bed with the covers pulled up to his chin throughout the proceedings. Proceed? Yeah, we're ready for arraignment. All right, you may proceed with the arraignment. Commonwealth versus Dopamine Taxiera, docket number 1703CR337. Complaint alleges that on May 5th, 2017, while in the vicinity of South Boston, he did commit the following criminal offenses. Count one, the charge of murder, with the alleged victim being Richard Field. Count two, the crime of murder, the alleged victim being Lena Balanovs. A plea of not guilty has entered on your behalf on both counts. His defence lawyer, Stephen Sack, subsequently entered pleas of not guilty on his behalf and refrained from advocating for bail. As the arraignment drew to a close, Texera softly uttered, Thank you. On the 12th of May, friends, family and associates of Richard and Lena congregated at Gate of Heaven Catholic Church in Boston to offer their final farewells. 
The service was overseen by Reverend Robert Casey, and approximately 500 people attended, a genuine testament to the profound affection held for the couple. He said to the mourners, There are so many in this city, in this nation, and around the world who mourn their death, without ever having met them. But even without having met them, many of us imagine how it was their compassion for others that possibly drew them together. He encouraged those in attendance to lift up their hearts to believe that the sadness of death gives way to the bright promise of immortality. Following the ceremony, the remains of Richard and Lena were transported in modest wooden urns, trailed by hundreds, a significant number of whom shed tears as the church bells resonated with a somber tone. Media personnel were excluded from the service itself, but beyond the church walls, everyone remarked upon the poignant and exquisite homage paid to the couple. Melissa Bavin, a nurse who worked with Richard during his time at Brigham and Women's Hospital, commented, He didn't care if you were a nurse or nursing assistant. We just became really good friends. The grief on her face was palpable, as she added, Even if you didn't see him for years, he just made you feel like you were the most important thing in the world. A nostalgic smile played on her lips, as she recollected the bond she had cultivated with Richard, which encompassed some crazy gatherings in the South End. She conveyed that he stood by her side during challenging personal moments, and that he had found his equal in Lena, who he loved deeply. Angel Velez, who crossed paths with Lena through his aunt, recounted that the ceremony included tributes from her cousin, in addition to Richard's siblings and nephew. In late June, Texera made a physical appearance in the courtroom for the first time. It was announced that the grand jury had formally charged him with allegations of murder, kidnapping and robbery. Those present in the courtroom were taken aback by his composed and nonchalant demeanour. Upon entering the courtroom, he greeted the clerk with, Hey, good morning, what's up? As the charges against him were recited aloud, he swayed and chuckled, seemingly reveling in the attention. Subsequently, he entered a plea of not guilty to the charges levelled against him. In the wake of the arraignment, Richard and Lena's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the apartment complex's owners, management and security providers, including the one that hired Texera. They accused the high-rise building of providing just a veneer of security and accused the security guard on duty that night of waiting 20 minutes to call 911 after receiving the phone call from Richard's friend. It read in part, Despite the appearance of operating a secure property, in fact, the defendants provided virtually no security for its residents whatsoever. For example, one can enter the garage with ease by simply walking from the street when the garage door is opening by a resident who is either entering or leaving the building's garage in their vehicle. The lawsuit also added that after Texier's conviction for the bank robberies, there should have been a review of security at the apartment complex, which would have shown it wasn't secure. The lawsuit was seeking a jury trial and all damages available. As the case was making its way through the justice system, detectives were piecing together the crime. They learned that on the morning of the murders, Richard and Lena awoke and got ready for the work day ahead. They kissed and said their goodbyes and set off to their respective jobs. They were blissfully unaware that that morning, another person was making their way to South Boston, Bampoom Texera. He was spotted outside the apartment complex at around 2.40pm, just standing around aimlessly. Several residents observed him, and some recognised him by sight as the old security guard, but they were unsure of what exactly he was doing there. Because of his previous employment, he knew the layout of the apartment complex like the back of his hand. He also knew he could bypass the security guard on duty at the concierge desk by obtaining access via the parking garage. He hung around for several hours, carrying a backpack filled with a combat-style knife, several fake guns, duct tape, and pliers. At about 4pm, Texera saw his opportunity to gain access to the building, when a resident returned home and opened up the parking garage, while occupants of the apartment complex would use the elevator accessible via the lobby. There was also a set of stairs that led from the parking garage the whole way up to Richard and Lena's penthouse. 
That evening, at about 5pm, Lena texted Richard. On my way home, I was the conference. Sometime later, she arrived back at the apartment complex alone. By this stage, Texier was already inside the condo, stuffing jewellery into his backpack. At the concierge desk, Lena signed for two packages, before making her way up to the 11th floor. She approached the front door, put her keys in, and unlocked it. The sound alerted Texiera, who slowly approached the front door. As soon as Lena opened up the door, she was ambushed, dropping her keys outside in the process. Texiera aimed the false gun at Lena and ordered her inside. She was frozen in fear, completely unaware that the gun was fake. He grabbed her and led her into the bedroom, where he duct taped her hands behind her back. At some point during the ordeal, Lena had managed to call 911, but her voice was muffled. The operator ultimately hung up on her, after being unable to decipher her replies, and she never called back. At about 6.31pm, Richard called Lena, but she never answered. He arrived back at the apartment complex a short time later. He took the elevator upstairs, and upon reaching the door, he noticed Lena's keys on the floor. When he entered the apartment, he was intercepted by Texera. It's not known for sure whether Lena was already dead at this stage, or whether she had just been bound in the bedroom. At some stage during the ordeal, Richard had managed to grab a hold of his cell phone. Between 7.06pm and 7.45pm, he called 911 five times. However, four of them didn't go through because he had either hung up or the line disconnected. When one of the calls did go through, the line was silent. The operator repeatedly asked, Hello, do you have an emergency? Hello, can I help you? Presumably, Richard was in the same room as Texera and couldn't speak on the call. That was when he decided to text his friend asking him to call 911. At some stage between 6pm and 6.30pm, both Richard and Lena were killed. It was believed the Texera had kept them alive for some stage, hence the number of text messages and phone calls. The pathologist couldn't determine who was killed first, and it's unknown whether one of them had to watch the other be killed. Jury selection for the murder trial began in November of 2019. By the 21st, they were selected and the trial was ready to begin. Texera was escorted into the courtroom, dressed in a thermal shirt and yellow sweatpants, and he took his respective place beside his defence team at the table. The courtroom was filled to the brim with all of Richard and Lena's loved ones, who had prepared themselves as best as possible for the gruesome testimony that was going to be presented. During their opening statements, prosecutors put forward their theory that the murders were the result of a robbery gone wrong. While they had first of all speculated that Richard and Lena knew Texera, they announced during the opening statements that they didn't know him. They may have known him to see, and he may have known them to see, from working as security at the apartment complex. However, that was the extent of their relationship. Prosecutor John Pappas said to the jury, the precise motivation behind the murders remains a mystery. He commented, the why in this case may never be clear, but the who will never be in doubt. He said that Texera acted with purpose and plan, adding that he alone was responsible for the double murder. There were no other accomplices or anybody else involved in the planning or execution of the murders. Texera's defence attorney, Stephen Sack, said to the jury during his opening statements that there was no credible evidence that he had broken into the 11th floor condo. He stated... You will be the judges of the facts in this case. You will be the judges of whether the conclusions are correct in this case. According to defense attorney Sack, his client certainly had been in the doctor's apartment that night, but he denied that he was the one who killed Lena. Despite the overwhelming evidence against Texera, including the fact he was arrested in the condo where the bodies were found, his defense attorney stated, There is no video, audio, or scientific evidence proving his guilt. The jury were then taken through the gruesome crime scene by officers who had been dispatched by the 911 call. 
They described how Texera appeared from the shadows and how they opened fire on him, fearing that he had a gun. The 911 call that Lena had placed before she was killed was also played aloud, and her godmother, Amanda Gibbs, testified. That was Lena's voice. Richard's friend Matthias told the jury how after calling 911, he and his girlfriend ordered an Uber over to Richard and Lena's apartment. By the time they arrived, it was already too late, and the apartment complex was swarming with police officers. Later that night, detectives informed him that Richard and Lena had been killed. After describing the scene for the jury, they were shown gruesome photographs of the crime scene, but not before being warned about the brutal nature of them by Judge Mitchell Kaplan. While Texier's defense attorney had said during his opening statements that there was no evidence connecting him to the murders, the jury would come to learn that that wasn't true. In addition to being arrested inside their apartment, the yellow shirt that he was wearing contained bloodstains. DNA proved that these bloodstains had come from both Richard and Lena. Julie James, a criminalist in the DNA section of the Boston Police Crime Lab, testified that she tested 20 items from the crime scene. This included bloodstains from the yellow shirt, two stains from a pair of boots, knives and a mask. The stain on the boots included DNA from Richard, Lena and Texera himself. The crime scene had also been analysed for fingerprints by Amanda Armstrong of the Boston Police Leighton Prince Unit. Fingerprints weren't found on the majority of the items, but as she explained, certainly wearing gloves would prevent you from leaving any fingerprints behind. However, fingerprints had been found on a roll of duct tape, as well as on a case and a Ziploc bag, both of which contained jewellery, and they were Texera's fingerprints. After the prosecution rested, the defence opted out of calling a single witness. Although the jury had heard the videotaped interview with Texera, in which he claimed he was having an affair with Lena, there was absolutely no evidence to corroborate Texera's claims. No communications between him and Lena, or anything else of that nature. Furthermore, both Lena and Richard had managed to dial 911 during the ordeal, both at very different stages. When Lena called 911, Richard still hadn't even arrived home. His arrival was documented on the apartment complex's security cameras. They were resting on the possibility that the prosecution hadn't presented an iron cast case against their client, hoping that there would be doubts in the minds of the jury. During closing arguments, Prosecutor Pappas told the jury that the evidence against Hexier was overwhelming. He referred to his version of events as utterly absurd and ridiculous and said the taxier had killed the couple while in the process of robbing them. And I would suggest we've gone, we've gone beyond the preposterous. We've gone beyond the preposterous. We're now, we're now existing in the theatre of the absurd. He said the taxier's defence would require the jury to believe that instead of having been a loving fiancé, Richard was a murderer and abuser. This went against everything the couple stood for and everything their loved ones said about them and loved them for. He stated, The only thing that does make sense is he ambushed her at the door. This attack on Lena started immediately, and it had nothing to do with Richard. Defence attorney Stephen Sack, in his closing argument, said to the jury, Now you've heard that he did kill Richard Field, but he killed in self-defence. And that's not murder. He then shockingly said, Mr. Texera and Dr. Bellanos were in love, but it wasn't the kind of love where they were expected to remember each other's names. Following the closing arguments, the jury were sent off to deliberate. After they left the courtroom, Texera had a random outburst, showing his true colours to the attorneys and the judge present. He shouted to Prosecutor Pappas. Hey, yo, Pappas, you better hope that I never get out of here. Hey, hey. He then threatened to sexually assault his wife. He was immediately escorted out of the courtroom. When he returned some time later, he had a second outburst. He showed his handcuffed hands to reporters before yelling at Richard and Lena's family, who sat in the front row. You want to know his last words? Be quiet. Be quiet. He said no. Once more, he was escorted out of the courtroom, and some time later, the jury returned with their verdict. Texera wasn't allowed back in the courtroom to hear their verdict. Offense 001, charging murder in the first degree, 
victim Lena Bolanos. You find the defendant not guilty, guilty of murder in the first degree, theory of deliberate premeditation, and or theory of extreme atrocity or cruelty, and or theory of felony murder, or guilty of murder in the second degree. We find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree under the theory of deliberate premeditation and the theory of extreme atrocity and for cruelty and the theory of felony murder. The jury announced to everybody else in the courtroom that they had found Taxiara guilty of first degree murder. Outside of court, District Attorney Rachel Rollins said that they were looking at levelling new charges against Taxiara for his courtroom outbursts. She commented, The grace and dignity that these families showed. I don't know if I could have done it. They were silent. They didn't have a voice. The defendant is able to engage in this outrageous behaviour in making allegations and defaming a person he slaughtered. She further said that his actions reaffirmed that they really did have the right person all along and that he had really exposed what his intent was. The sentencing was scheduled for the following day, but Dexier was a no-show. He had requested to not be in the courtroom to learn his fate because he couldn't control himself. Instead, he observed the proceedings from another room via video link while he was surrounded by armed court officers. Richard and Lena's family were in attendance to provide poignant victim impact statements, highlighting the loss of their loved ones. Lena's mother, Anne, talked about her daughter's passion for medicine and her deep love for Richard. Richard's brother, Jason Field, described his brother as his life advisor and best friend. He said that they try to keep the couple's memory alive by imagining that they're just away travelling. He then referred to Texera as a monster. Bampoon Texera was then sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Outside of court, the couple's family said that they were pleased that their names had been cleared and that the man who killed them would never be able to hurt anybody else ever again. Lena's mother, Anne, solemnly said, It hurt me tremendously to hear defamations about them. I know I will never get to see my daughter again, or Richard for that matter, but that monster will not destroy any more families. In 2022, a Superior Court judge ruled that Lena and Richard's family could sue the Condominium Trust over an alleged security lapse. It was revealed that just nine months before the murders, either Richard or Lena had expressed concern to management that neighbours were accessing their floor via the unlocked stairwell. That lawsuit is still underway. Dr Richard Field and Dr Lena Bolanos were dedicated healers, showing compassion that touched lives. In their prime, they had a beautiful home, flourishing careers and wedding plans. But these aspirations were shattered by Bampoon Texera's violent act, exposing the vulnerability of home security. Their story is a stark reminder that safety isn't always guaranteed, even where we should feel most safe. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening, and I'd like to say a big massive thank you to my new supporters up on Patreon, Kathy, Chloe, and Christy. As you all know, Morbidology is a one-woman team, so the support up on there seriously goes such a long way. So please feel free to check Morbidology out on Patreon if you'd like to support the show that way. In exchange for your support, I upload ad-free and early release episodes, bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus that aren't on the regular podcast platforms, behind the scenes, which includes bonus audio, videos and case files, and I also send out some cool merch. If you'd like to support the show in another way, please consider leaving me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you're listening. Ratings and reviews are an easy way to support a show that you like, and they're really fantastic for independent podcasts. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week.